Howdy folks, I'm your host Aaron Heath. I'd like to take a moment to thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly listening to episode number 35 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Now you can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 035. Well, we've got a pretty short, simple show to go with this week. It's uh, <laughs> it's one of those that's a product of not having that much time. So, you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and run with it. You know, the gun of the show for this episode is a Sig Sauer P226. And this particular gun is a law enforcement trade-in that was not part of the uh, Sig Redbox program. Now, as many people know, Sig Sauer has been a supplier of arms for military and law enforcement agencies for, oh man, a long time. Uh, I mean, they got a great, beautiful history. They're... It's a great company, at least from a gun owner's angle, it is. Now, if you look hard enough, you can find certified pre-owned SIG pistols that have gone back to SIG Sauer. They've been reconditioned, and they're sold through the company's official retail channels. Those particular weapons come with a one-year warranty, and they're packaged in a red box. Now, when you purchase one of those weapons, you know you're getting a good factory reconditioned weapon that has already seen service, and you're getting it at a discounted price compared to a new gun just like it. Now, there may be some blemishes on the gun, some holster wear, but that just adds character. However, there is another option. You can often find used SIG pistols at a large number of gun stores, especially the larger stores that equip law enforcement officers and uh, agencies. Sometimes those very same guns appear at the smaller stores when a distributor for a larger store takes a trade-in for a dealer and that dealer is accepting a large number of guns as a trade-in for a new uh, for a new series of guns for that same agency. So let's say you have, uh, I don't know, we'll go with a XYZ department who they're, they're trading in their SIG P226s because they don't like the 40 caliber and they want to transition to the 9mm for extra capacity and less recall. And they're going to trade in all these SIGs and they're going to, instead of sticking with the SIG Sauer brand, let's say they're going to go to a Glock or they're going to go to an MMP or they're going to go to an FN. Well, a lot of times the distributor will make a deal with the dealer. Okay, you're going to sell a bunch of these guns and we will buy the used guns from you and we'll sell them used to our other dealers. Well, these smaller dealers will take these pistols and I'll just put them in their case, used uh, SIG Sauer, yada, yada, and go from there. Well. That's kind of how a gun that I've got for this particular uh, gun of the show came about and came about to be in my possession. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, a while back, a few years ago, I was in a gun store in Lubbock, Texas, and I was looking around, and, well, one of my favorite brand of pistols was in the display case, and it was marked ridiculously cheap. It was used, and I asked to see it. I checked it out, and I decided right then and there I wanted to buy this gun. So after a quick trip to the dealer, I get back, I I mean, it's like just a few minutes before close. I fill out the 4473, and he says, well, I hope you're not planning to pick it up today because we are having trouble with the phone lines. Somebody cut a fiber optic cable, and long-distance calls were not happening. However, I have a Texas concealed handgun license, so that became a moot point. I told him, well, we don't need to call it in because I got a CHL. He says, oh, okay, that's perfect. He says, I'll get you out of here quicker now that we've got that than I would have if I'd called you in. Well, and then my driver's license, my CHL, my cash. He comes back, gives me the receipt, me and my gun walk out. And, uh, well, it's been a nice gun since then. Now, this particular gun is a Clinton Assault Weapons Ban Era SIG. This particular gun, the proof marks on it, yep, you heard me right, proof marks, indicate it was made around 97. The magazines have the infamous restricted law enforcement, government use, and or export only, 91494. The magazines are marked that way because, well, any, capac- any magazine with a capacity over 10 rounds had to be marked that way in between 94 and 2004. And this gun is from that era. Now, this being an older SIG, it has the folded stamp steel slide, the made in Germany, not the made in West Germany, but the made in Germany stamp. And as I said before, it does have the German proof marks. And more importantly than anything else, this gun has one of my favorite features. It has a lack of an accessory rail. 
The reason it does not have an accessory rail, SIG really didn't have them on their guns at that time. At least not their uh, 226. I think you might have been able to get it as an option then, but it wasn't something that was a standard feature. Now, this particular weapon came with a blue box instead of the red because it wasn't a certified pre-owned SIG, and the blue box, which the serial number on the box matched the serial number on the gun, the box said law enforcement. That was kind of cool. Well, the thing that really sold me on the gun, besides the condition it was in, was the price. It was quite low, and when you consider that the gun came with four 15-round magazines, well, it was a stupid deal to pass up. The only downside on the gun when I bought it was the fact that the whole grips on the gun had been cut down to provide a custom, note my despise of the word custom in this case, but it was cut, the grips were cut down to provide a custom thumb rest. And the reason I dislike it is the person who the thumb rest was cut for didn't have a hand the same size as mine. Now, shortly after I purchased the pistol, I had the opportunity to purchase some nil walnut grips for it. And I got the grips directly from SIG at a steeply discounted price. And being an addict of, you know, grips, because that's kind of one of the things you can, well, some people will OCD or be distracted by shiny objects. For me, it's grips. You want my money? Wave a set of grips for a gun I own or a set of grips I think are really cool in front of me. I'll probably go ahead and buy them. I might go without eating for a few days in order to pay for them, but I'll probably buy a, buy a set of grips if the, I like them. And it doesn't take much to make me like grips. Well, after I got the grips on it, I decided these grips are perfect for the gun, and they've been the grips I've had on it for the most part since I got the grips. I think I've had them off two or three times. One time I had a set of hoe grips on it because a friend of mine borrowed the gun to qualify for their concealed handgun license. And I think I had the whole grips on it when I sent it in for the SIG service plan, which is coincidentally the next thing I was wanting to talk about. Right after I ordered the grips, you know, a few months later, SIG had a discount on their SIG service plan. Now, the SIG service plan is a program where you can send a USIG in to SIG Sour and have it worked over in their custom shop so that the gun gets all the common wear springs, pins, and minor components replaced, along with a set of new night sights. In the end, after I had the SIG service plan, the new grips, and all the other little niceties I've added to the gun, because, well, a SIG isn't a SIG unless it's been worked over. Now, none of the work on the gun affects the trigger or any of that. I, had a, I have a friend who's a SIG armor go through. He deburred the rails, and it kind of surprised me that the rails actually could be deburred. I couldn't see any difference. But you can feel it in the gun when you cycle the slide by hand. It's kind of it's kind of hard to describe. I guess there's just tiny little imperfections the human eye cannot really see that he has a tool to remove. But he went through. He gave the slide and the frame rails a little bit of work. He did a few other little things, uh, you know. And then right after he did that, I sent it back to Sig, and I understand Sig would have done the same thing in the process of performing the Sig service plan. However. The SIG service plan, the grips, and I've got a gun here for a fraction of the cost of even one of the ones that were uh, the certified pre-owned. That's every bit as good. It's the same gun as a certified pre-owned SIG, except it's got an upgraded grip on it. Overall, this is actually one of my favorite guns. But you know what? I've talked about the SIG 226 enough. I need to change subjects, and before I can do that, I need to give you some specs. So this gun is a model to, uh, P226. In this particular case, it's a 1997 vintage. It's chambered in 9mm, has a capacity of 15 plus 1. The trigger's a double action, single action trigger with a decocker. It has uh, SIG light night sights. It has a steel slide, aluminum frame, and walnut grips. The thing about the slide on this, as I mentioned earlier, it's folded steel. And then there's a breech block that's uh, pinned into the slide. Kind of a cool design. Some people think the uh, new uh, machine slides are better, and they probably are from an engineering point of view, but I have never heard of anybody having problems with the stamp slide, so I really don't see any problems there. The weight of this gun when I had it weighed, oh, that was some time back, is 33 and a half ounces. I want to say it was dirty after a range trip, and we probably put about two, 3,000 rounds through it before we cleaned it because that particular range trip was over three or four days 
we were shooting, and we weren't shooting my ammo. We were shooting somebody else's. He had sold all of his 9 millimeters. He had about 4,000 rounds of ammo. We had two 9 millimeter pistols, and he wanted to use all the ammo. I want to say this gun shot anywhere from half to three quarters of the ammo he had on hand. MSRP on a newer version of this same gun, which the newer version would have the rail and it would have the night sights in the version I priced, MSRP on that would be $1,108. So take it for what it is. This gun has always been a good gun for me. I like it. It's been reliable. It's consistent. And it's scary accurate. With that said, I'm going to run the audio clip that lets you know where you can get the show, as well as the fact that that's not included in that audio clip. This podcast is in or is available on YouTube as well. However, you don't have to see my ugly mug on YouTube. You see, I just put up the show logo and in the case of the SIG 22 or whatever the gun that we're talking about, you'll see the picture of the firearm of the show when we're talking about the firearm of the show. Now then, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to play that audio clip, and don't forget, you can also get the show on YouTube. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, and in the Microsoft Windows podcast store. Of course, you can always download the show and see the show notes as well as comment by going to the website, gunrightsintexas.com. Alrighty, now then, we have a bit of listener email, and I'm not going to go through it all. I only have a handful that people have actually said, yeah, you can talk about on the air. And I'm really thinking about a change in policy in that regard, but I'm not sure how I'm going to go about it. So, here's a situation. In the last episode, I was talking about Miranda and uh, Zach Lawson, were they related. Turns out they didn't think they were, but they asked to be put in touch with each other. Well, Miranda emailed me back, and Miranda, I've seen her go by Myra, and I've seen her go by Miranda. She seems to use the two interchangeably, but she wrote in to say that uh, she and Zach are actually related. It seems they are very distant cousins. Now, she also answered a question that I had emailed her where a listener had wanted to know if uh, I knew her name was the same as a video game character, and was she just using that name? Well... Turns out she replied that uh, she was not using the name of the video game character, and it was in fact her name but long before the video character was around. Now, Miranda even asked me which OC bill I preferred, and I wanted to point out that, or she wanted to point out that the Sinister Six that prohibit open carry of handguns, with very limited exceptions in some cases, are California, Florida, Illinois, New York, South Carolina, and unfortunately, Texas. Well, I'll be honest. With fixes, I would be more than willing to put 100% support behind uh, HB 195. However, I don't think we've seen all the open carry bills. They probably won't be filed until after the session starts. The TSRA doesn't really like pre-filing their bills. And I have a sneaking suspicion we'll see a licensed open carry bill from the TSRA, and I'll probably support it 100% as well. Now, somebody might say, well, you can't support two bills 100%. Yes, you can. You see, the way it works is when the bill comes up, you call, you email, you fax, you do everything you can to say, hey, I want you to support this bill. And then let's say the other bill comes up. You do the same thing. That way, they both have a good chance of making it to the governor's desk. Well, let's say that uh, the, the House passes both licensed and unlicensed bills. The Senate gets them. Senate bogs down and only one bill makes it through. Guess what? We still advance the ball. It doesn't matter which one it was because we no longer are where we were. We're moving forward. The Senate advances their bill or advances one of the bills. It goes to a conference committee. They iron out any details. Both houses approve it. It goes to the governor's desk. It gets signed September 1st. We have open carry. However, if both bills make it through both houses, then it goes to the governor. At which point, we have to make a decision. We can't support both bills 100% if they both go to the governor because they're conflicting. So we email the governor and we say, hey, we want you to support, uh, we want you to support 
the unlicensed bill by signing it and veto the license carry bill. Even though we worked hard to get that bill to the governor's desk because we have a bill that has that's better on his desk at the same time, we want him to kill the bill that's not as good. But just in case one bill doesn't make it, we want to push both. With that said, we don't want to push a bad open carry bill when we have better options. So let's say we have an open carry licensed open carry bill that modifies Texas Penal Code Section 30.6. We have a licensed open carry bill that doesn't touch 30.6, and we have an unlicensed open carry bill. Well, we push the unlicensed open carry bill, and we push the open carry bill with a license that does not touch 30.6. We leave. We don't push the one that messes with 30.6 because that will cause more problems than it solves. Simply because a lot of people will be fighting to kill that bill. We can invest more political resources into the other two and go away from that happier. So basically, I support pretty much every open carry bill that does not alter Texas Penal Code Section 30.6. Even if that bill needs repairs, I support it because I will support getting the repairs made to the bill. Those repairs don't get made, I'll reevaluate and change my position. Now, we had quite a few listeners uh, email us about a situation in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And this situation is where Ferguson protesters in Dallas were followed around by Katie. Katie being a uh, come and take it. Now, I personally think this was a bad idea and it could be used to inflame tensions by the media. Additionally, it could be used to illustrate gun owners as crazy redneck militia KKK members. And here's why. You have a situation being used to generate racial tensions across the country. The traditional media, the politicians, the race baiters, the criminal elements, they're all feeding off of this. And they're feeding off of it in order to further their own interests and agendas. Now you take a topic, which in this case would be guns and gun rights, that they have had a limited effect on recently, and then you take that topic and you shove it right into the middle of what they think is the perfect storm, And now they're going to be on the effort to attack gun rights and firearms ownership and anything associated with it. And they're going to do exactly what we would do if the situation was reversed. They will do everything they can to capitalize on it. We all know that the media is typically not friendly to gun rights. So basically, you can expect them to spin this every way they can to hurt us. Then you have politicians that want exposure and sound bites. They'll go out of their way to say things along the lines of, This kind of attempted vigilante justice must not be allowed to happen. These militant gun nuts need some kind of law to prevent them from going out and trying to find an excuse to shoot someone. And then you'll have the race baiters who will use the situation to claim these racists were following peaceful protesters in the hopes that they might get a chance to shoot a minority who stepped out of line. And the criminals, well, they'll just take advantage of it to start problems that they can use in any way that they possibly can imagine. Think about it. You have people that are following a crowd that's going to get violent if everybody's thinking correctly, which in this case they didn't, possibly because there were three men following them with guns. Possibly it was because this particular crowd wasn't going to get violent. Who knows? However, you have these same people, and in this crowd, let's say, imagine you have someone that's wanting to cause a problem. He dials 911, three men with guns are acting stupid. They pointed them at us at some point, yada, yada. I think they may be going over there to rob a bank. Well, the police show up. Naturally, the police are focused on the gun, you know, the people carrying guns and the guns that they're being, uh, that they're carrying. And while the police are dealing with this, the criminal element goes out and then they start their riot. Yeah, the police are nearby, but the police are now the target of the riot and the gun owners help provide the distraction. And that's really what the problem is. Now, politically, this was also a bad idea. Did it generate any good publicity? Not that I can see. Of course, this really didn't pop up on my radar. Not until a few days later. The one news report I saw prior to this thing popping up on my radar in its natural form came in the form of an email from a listener. And that's the thing. Only one listener sent me an email to his news article. The rest of them are from the Dallas area. They saw it on the news, and they emailed me saying, hey, what's your opinion on this? However, the one news report I saw from that was emailed to me 
treated the Katie members as being more of a curiosity than anything else. In all honesty, I really think it was a bad idea politically. We'll probably see some kind of uh, attack in the legislature. And through my normal channels that I have stuff up, come up on my radar, there was a news story that we'll touch on in just a little bit that, well, we'll, we'll actually, uh, they'll actually show how this could be used as an attack on gun owners. However, first, let me run the contact audio clip and we'll be right back. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on social media. Links to all the social media profiles can be found on the website. On Twitter, the podcast is at Gun Rights NTX. On Facebook and Google Plus, it is Gun Rights in Texas. So please be social. All right. Well, I'm going to wing it on this episode. I don't really have a topic picked out. That's kind of why I was focusing on the story about the Katie members and the gun of the show. So let's talk a little bit about the right to keep and bear arms or the big picture regarding it. You see, gun ownership is not the beginning or the end of gun rights, nor is the right to carry. The easiest way to put this is if you have the right to keep and bear something, you have to have the right to be able to use that item. Because if you, the founding fathers really did not believe in collecting things that were not going to be used. And uses of firearms range from self-defense to the defense of your nation to defense from your nation in some limited extreme circumstances to hunting to competition and recreation. And the Second Amendment is about all of these and more. If you can think of a legitimate use for a firearm, then the Second Amendment covers it. Why? Because the right to keep something and the right to bear it means you have the right to use it. This is what a lot of... This is an implied right. It's a right that's implied by the right to keep and the right to bear. Well, why why is the law or lack of law critical to gun rights? Well, the easiest way to describe it is, in the United States, we have this concept that what is not prohibited by law is legal. So, let's say gun ownership is not prohibited by law anywhere, under any circumstances. That means criminals can't own a gun. I mean, the criminals can't own a gun. Uh, everyday citizens can own a gun. There's no impingement on who can own what. And that's really how it was up until around 1934. So imagine you're back around the Civil War times and you have the money, you go out and you're going to buy, you're going to buy your own weapon. You could actually buy a cannon. You could buy a machine gun in the form of a Gatling gun. You could buy a revolver. You could buy the scary uh, weapon that, uh, was the assault weapon of its day and that was the winchester lever action you could buy all these you could buy there were there were a lot of guns out there and you could buy all of them it didn't matter if you had if you were a convicted murderer that had just got out of prison you walk out the prison doors down the dirt road a little ways walk into the gun store whip out the money that you were given back or that you were given while you were in prison buy a gun strap it a holster strap it on walk out It didn't matter if you were a little old housewife that was being beat by her husband. You could walk into the gun store. You could put the money down. You could walk out with the gun. It didn't matter if you were a preacher, a sinner, a saint. None of it mattered. If you had the money, you could buy the gun. If you had the gun, you could own it. And that changed with the the Gun Control Act of 1934, I believe. But let's say that, but let's say it was done differently. You see, the the law at the federal level is criminals or felons cannot purchase, own, or possess a firearm, but everybody else basically can. Well, there's two ways to go about achieving that. One is you say, okay, these people are prohibited from owning this object or possessing this object. And the other option is you say this object is illegal, but here are some exceptions where you can own it. And these two are entirely different. The first is American. And the second is basically how New Jersey works. Essentially, when it comes to firearms in New Jersey, everything is illegal, but there are exceptions. And in that type of situation, the onus of proving that proving your right falls not on the state, but the citizen. 
So let's say you are in New Jersey. They come in, they say, okay, you have this illegal object. And you say, well, I'm legal to own it because of this. And the officer says, I don't agree with that. You're under arrest. You're going to jail. You go to jail, you go to trial, and you have to prove you had an exception to own that object. Well, we have something similar in Texas. It is the uh, how the law is on suppressors. In the last episode, I didn't, I didn't uh, argue this point at all against what had been posted in the Slow Facts blog. In fact, I gave it to him right off the bat. He is right. The law in this regard in Texas could use a little work. But you know what? We haven't had any problems with it, so right now, it's probably going to remain just the way it is. However, we don't have prohibitions on who can own a gun in Texas unless they meet criteria that prohibits them from owning them. And that leads us to where does the law come from? Well, in the United States, you have three branches of government. You have a legislative branch, you have an executive branch, and you have a a judicial branch. All three of these branches of government have some form of say in the law. Let's take a look at the executive branch real fast. Typically, the executive branch will receive laws that are written by the legislative branch, and they'll either sign them into law or veto them. Sometimes the legislative branch can say, yeah, about that veto, we're going to override it, and it's going to become law anyway. But it's difficult to override a veto, so you really don't see many laws being passed this way, although it has happened, and it does happen. Well... The executive branch is also in charge of enforcing those laws. And sometimes the executive branch isn't exactly all that keen on, in, on following their oath to obey and enforce the laws. And what happens is they decide they don't like this law. They're not going to enforce it. Now imagine, let's say the executive branch said, yeah, we don't like the law that prohibits the registration of new machine guns. So we're not going to enforce that. We're going to allow people to register new machine guns. And all of a sudden, you have all these machine guns being registered. (laughs) Well, somebody goes to court. Court says, yeah, all these registrations on these new machine guns are illegal. These machine guns are illegal. Legislature's already said new machine guns can't be registered. Oh, wait a minute. Executive branch is in trouble. He has to either comply or the legislative branch is going to impeach him. (laughs) That's how the system's supposed to work. But let's say, let's say that we're done with the executive branch and let's look at the legislative branch. Typically in the United States, you have, and in Texas, this is the case, you have two houses in the legislature and basically both houses can propose bills. Both houses can pretty much define what goes into a bill. And when the bill makes its way through both houses, If there's any differences between how it made its way between the two houses, it'll go to a conference committee. That committee will iron out the differences. Both houses will vote either to accept the changes to the version of the bill, or they'll vote to reject those changes, in which case they've got to go back and iron it out again. But eventually, the bill is either dead, or the bill goes to the governor or the president's desk, and it gets signed. Well, everybody's pretty much familiar with that, so we really don't need to go into detail on that. But the thing where people get confused is what's called case law. Case law really isn't law. It's just kind of a guide to interpreting the law. And you see a lot of people, when they get confused about case law, they'll be, well, we're in the same circuit as this court, and they decided this was the law, how this law was illegal, uh, it cannot be enforced. And they're wrong because, A, It could be an appellate court, or it could be a trial court, and trial courts don't make case law. Or it could be an appellate court, which does make case law, but that appellate court is not for the entire district or the entire uh, jurisdiction. Its jurisdiction is much smaller than the whole jurisdiction. And when you have an appellate court, you see, oh man, this is, I'm I'm not an attorney, so I'm not the best person to describe this. But basically, you have appellate courts with varying jurisdictions, and they work differently in different jurisdictions. So let's say you have a trial court makes a decision, and then they go to the appellate court. The appellate court makes their decision. 
if that appellate court says we're not, this is not a published decision, then it does not become quote unquote case law. If it is a published decision, then it's considered to be case law. Now, let's say that decision goes on to an appellate court above it, and eventually it makes its way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court of the state or the Supreme Court of the United States gets the case, they make their decision, and then all of a sudden, everything that's under the jurisdiction of that Supreme Court now has case law. But you cannot have a uh, you cannot have an appellate court say in Louisiana that covers Louisiana and Texas make case law that affects somebody in California, which their appellate courts are going to be covering. Uh, I want to say Washington, Oregon, California, and Hawaii. Essentially, you have you have separate jurisdictions. And these appellate courts only affect their jurisdiction. I'm, I'm repeating myself because I don't feel I've explained it well enough. However, the easy way to determine, does this become case law? Ask yourself, was the decision rendered at trial or was it rendered at appeal? If it's rendered at appeal, is the decision kind of, is the decision a published decision or is it an unpublished decision? If it's published, it's at an appellate court. It's case law. If one of those is no, it's probably not case law. So let's talk about what you can do when the law violates your rights. And I'm hesitant to go into this because, well, because of a news item we have later in the show. However, you really have three options when you have a violation of your rights. You can legislate, which means you go to the legislature, you get a bill introduced, you go through all the rigmarole, you get it to the governor's desk, you get it signed. And now you have changed the situation where the law no longer violates your rights. That's a long, slow process that, well, is expensive. It's not as long, it's not as slow, and it's not as expensive as the next option, which is litigate. Litigating your rights means that you go to court, you fight the law, you get the law overturned in court on an appell- at an appellate level, and now the law no longer applies. It's considered bad law. It's considered overturned, whatever, it's no longer applicable. And the third option is liberate. This is often a very bad idea. Very few revolutions ever work out the way that they're intended. Typically, you have a larger, a larger body break down into civil unrest. You see the formation of warlords or militias that move around and pretty much do whatever they want because they're They're now the power in the area. They may not be the government, but they are the power. So when you do the whole liberation thing, keep in mind, it will probably end badly. And you see a lot of people, they're they're really pushing to do the whole liberate thing. When, When I get an email, when I get an email, there's a good chance. I'd probably say one out of every 20 emails, so 5% of the email I get, People are talking about revolution in some form. It may just be the three percenter crowd running their mouth, or it may be the uh, it may be somebody saying, "Hey, I think it's time that we do something about the lawlessness in the White House." And when they do that, they're they're being stupid. This is not the time for a revolution. If it ever gets bad enough that we have to do it, well, we won't have much of an option. And some people will disagree with me on that statement, but I don't think it is. You know, the more I think about it, the more I think a lot of people want to do the whole internet commando keyboard, uh, keyboard special forces type thing because, well, they have a Walter Mitty complex. They imagine themselves being the hero, becoming the uh, leader of the free world, yada, yada. And they really don't ever think through what they're talking about. A lot of the problems we're experiencing right now in the world are because of failed revolutions. And when I say a failed revolution, that means the revolution did not get somebody into power that could control the country. You see it all over the world. We saw it in the Congo. We saw it in Libya. It's happening all over. And it's it doesn't work. I would rather have a peaceful revolution where the, the battle is fought in the ballot box where the government's changed with uh, votes and uh, lawyers 
and court decisions rather than where the government's changed with bullets and grenades and rockets and RPGs and things like that. But you know what? We have a great system in the United States to affect change without having to resort to the ballot or without having to resort to the bullet box. We have the ballot box. We have the soap box. And then we have the jury box. We have three other boxes to turn to before we find it necessary to go to the dreaded ammo box. And anybody that anybody that does not like that is just a nut job. So on that note, I want to run this little audio clip that tells you essentially, I know earlier I said how to contact the show. It was the social media things, but this time I really am going to run the contact audio clip. And when I do, and it's done, we'll come back, we'll touch on the news, and we'll wrap this episode up. And you, I swear, the news is planned out. Everything you just heard, I was typing it up as I was speaking it. I didn't have an outline, and I apologize. But I've been busy with work. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at GunRightsInTexas.com. Or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is GunRightsInTexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. Well, to kick the news off, we're going to talk about a situation that's going to be in our In Defense of Self and Others category. This particular story comes to us from Louisville, Texas, where police shot and killed a man suspected of carjacking at least one other person while he was trying to carjack a woman at a gas station. Now, the suspect was armed with a shotgun, and he fired at least one round at an officer. Basically, this was a bad man, and the police made him a little less bad. Now, the next story I want to touch on, and you can find the links for all these in the show notes where you can get all the details. The next story I want to touch on is one coming to us out of El Paso. And this story is by KFOX14 and has the headline of Borderland Gun Instructors Push for Open Carry Law. Now, this article features an excerpt from an interview with Eric Howard who says, If it hurts my business, that's fine. I'd rather have people have their constitutional right and have a little less money because it's the right thing to do. Now, this would more than likely be in reference to House Bill 195. Also in the politics category, which is what the last story was in, we have a story about it, something I touched on in the listener emails. And this article is kind of what I was trying to get at. You see, here's an article where the Katie members were following the Ferguson protesters in Dallas, and this is going to be used to attack gun owners in the OC movement. Now, the source for the article does admit to having a left-leaning slant, so... So take this article with a grain of salt. Now we also have a story in the criminal activity category. And this one, this one comes to us out of Austin, Texas. In what was suspected of being an anti-government attack, a single gunman was killed after shooting at police, police headquarters, the federal courthouse, and the Mexican consulate in Austin. The suspect, it seems, had devices that were thought to be possible explosive devices in his van and on himself, although they were later determined not to be such. Now, from what I understand, he used uh, either components or actual camp stoves to try and burn down the Mexican consulate as well. And the bottles or the devices they thought could have been explosive devices were actually bottles for those types of stoves, I believe. I mean, this is a guy that was trying to do the whole government revolution thing, you know, anti-government, government bad, destroy all government. Don't get me wrong. I would love to see a lot less government, but it's going to take a lot of work to get us there. And going around shooting people, shooting at people, shooting at buildings, that's not going to do anything to help. This guy probably hurt the hurt uh, his cause more than he helped it, all because he had to go and be stupid and do stupid things. And finally, we have a story in the miscellaneous category. And this one, I'm throwing this one out there because hunting accidents happen far too often. And I want to say, anytime you're out there hunting, please, for the love of God, for for the love of your fellow man, follow the four rules of gun safety. This will help keep you and those around you safe. Now, this story comes uh, from near Woodville, Texas, where an 18-year-old man was killed while hunting uh, deer 
What happened was his cousin mistook him for a deer. This is why we have the rule, be sure of your target and what uh, is beyond it. If you're not sure of your target, don't take the shot. I mean, basic safety precautions will do wonders. You know what? I want to wrap this episode up. I've rambled and gone through. I mean, the news, it was better planned than the topic segment, but in all honesty, it wasn't planned out too well. Basically, I just grabbed the articles and uh, gave a quick summary, and I kind of typed up, retyped the summary as I was going through describing it. So you'll have something a little closer to what I talked about when, if you go to the show notes. And once again, those show notes are available at gunrightsintexas.com slash 035. With that said, I would like to thank everybody involved in Texas politics. I'd like to thank the TSRA, the NRA, anybody that's actually trying to further gun rights. They have my thanks. Those out there trying to hurt gun rights, even though they think they're trying to help, they don't have my thanks, but uh, even though their heart may be in the right place, they need to get their mind there too. With that said, stay safe. and. Please come back and listen again. After the music, I'll give you a very brief Texas legislative update. It's There's no new legislative news that I have had come up since the last episode, but I do feel there is something I need to touch on that's uh, related to legislation, and that'll be right after the sign-off music. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly. All right, time for our Texas legislative update. Now, I don't communicate directly with anybody from Open Carry Texas, uh, at least the leadership, unless they approach me or they go somewhere I frequent. Now, recently, C.J. Grisham came over to the Texas CHL Forum, which you can I fully endorse that website. I think it's a great resource. Uh, Charles Cotton administers it. He pretty much founded it. And if you want a if you want a website that has a lot of information, a lot of analysis, and it really does get right to the point, then the Texas CHL Forum is the one to go to. All you got to do is type texasCHLforum.com into the address bar on your browser, and you can go there. But like I was saying, CJ Grisham recently came over to the Texas CHL Forum website, and he has stirred up a little bit of stink, and then he kind of backed off and has refused to respond to three simple questions that were directed at him by Charles Cotton. Those questions are, number one, Will OCT support any or all licensed open carry bills during the 2015 legislative session? Number two, will OCT oppose any or all licensed open carry bills? And finally, number three, will OCT support only HB 195 unlicensed open carry? Those questions were posed to C.J. Grisham on the forum by Charles Cotton, and we we haven't heard back from him. I would love for CJ to reply to those. I have reasons different than Charles for wanting to reply, but I want to hear the answers to them. Charles wants to hear the answers. However, I suspect that OCT won't be uh, making his statement or won't be uh, making any answers to those questions because, well, to answer those questions, he would, uh, OCT, CJ Grisham, would actually have to take a position on something without, well, without being able to back out of it later. And after all, backtracking seems to be one of the things that OCT is quite good at. Uh, I'll be honest. People may not realize this, but there have been a number of times that OCT has revised their position on something. They have said one thing, and then later they say something else. Their position's changing. In fact, their position's changing more than a politician uh, during primaries. And this is not good. If OCT wants to be any kind of force to be reckoned with in politics, they're going to have to learn how to take a position and stick with it. You know what? That does it for for this episode. That does it for the Texas Legislative Update. And my rambling has gone on far longer than I anticipated. With that said, stay safe and please carry responsibly.